right, good morning. It is Palm Sunday. We're excited to be worshiping with the Lord as this begins the start of Holy Week for us. If you're a guest and you've not filled out one of these Connect cards, there's a one right in front of you in, in the pew. Uh, please fill out one of these Connect cards. Just let, give us some general information. Uh, drop it in and take it back to the, um, to the guest reception. I'd be happy to give you a, a gift today. We truly enjoy getting to know new people who are first time to Cedar Crest or have been perhaps several months to Cedar Crest and you can slip in and slip out. Uh, and we haven't gotten to know your name yet. Uh, we definitely want to know you and you to get to know us as well. Uh, next Sunday is Easter Sunday morning, right? All right. We have two services, 8.30 and 10 a.m. At the 8.30 service is our children's program, right? And then at the 10 a.m. is just the nursery side of things, right? 10.30. There we go. Thank you. I can read from here, too, so and here. So 10.30. Thank you. Thank you. So used to the 10 a.m. Okay, so 10.30, that was uh, actually intentional on my part to make sure you're all paying attention to that one. <laughs> and what's going on, but this Friday, right, uh, is, is our Good Friday service at 6.30 p.m. Uh, please grab one of these, uh, these cards uh, and invite somebody. I was actually at Home Depot Friday morning talking to somebody. There's a guy we were talking about glue, right? And so then he said, like, do you need any advice? And I'm the last person to talk and give advice about glue, uh, but I did. Uh, and I said, and, like, and he ended up telling me his profession. I was like, oh, I did some construction back in the day, and now I'm a pastor. And I was like, and then we started talking about some religious things. And I said, hey, Easter's coming. And so I said the criteria was if my, my um, advice about glue was good, he needs to come on Sunday morning and stuff. If not, he will never appear here on a Sunday morning. But uh, you're always looking for little, small, sometimes silly bridges to talk about God. Most people come to church not because of just a random invite card, but because of a personal relationship that they have with somebody. We are ambassadors of Jesus Christ, and so we need to go and spread his word to people and inviting people to come on Sunday morning. And yes, Easter is not, Christianity is not big time part of our culture that much anymore, but God is still on people's hearts, and they need to know who he is. So, amen? All right, today was the last day of our spring trimester, uh, and then you get a chance to sign up for the next uh, trimester coming up. It's starting up in two weeks, so please go to the website uh, to get more information about what the Discipleship Institute classes are being held at 845 to 945. It is some really good teaching. I encourage every single person to go to one of these classes. Uh, they, we have some phenomenal teachers here at this church, and I hope that you will take part of that a, a, as well. So please take the time, go and do that, um, and you will definitely benefit from that. Coming up on Saturday, May 4th, the, the Women's Ministry is, is having a mother and daughter tea event, but making sure it's known that all women are invited to come to this as well. Uh, it's a special event to honor uh, on Bright Hope Pregnancy Center, which is we partner with them, and they bring hope to women who are thinking about an abortion. And we want to be able to honor them and bring specific items for that day as well to be able to help women in this community not to choose an abortion, but to choose life. How awesome is that? So please, uh, more information uh, you can find out on the website, and then we're going to be having sign up start uh, next week as well. Uh, there's a new little uh, ministry that we're starting up, kind of an addition to one. Uh, as you know, uh, we're semi of a large church here. Uh, and then we're, as a church, we're constantly having people um, in the hospital at, at times. And as pastors and elders and stuff, we, we try to make an intention to go and to visit somebody in the hospital. And I'm well aware that some people just do not want to be visited uh, as well. Uh, and so, but sometimes we do miss somebody. And so publicly I'll say, I'm sorry if you've been in the hospital, you wanted to be visited, uh, but we just missed you for some, some reason, right? Uh, it's not our intention to ignore anybody, uh, but sometimes it just happens, right? Uh, in Scripture, in James chapter 5, it says, Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. There is a responsibility as pastors and elders to go and to pray with people that are sick, right? 
There's also responsibility for those who are sick to what? Call on the elders, right? And so there's a piece of a back and forth and be able to shepherd and to love each other well. And so knowing sometimes that we do miss somebody, I'm always trying to think of like, how do we care for people better here at this church? And so this idea was presented to me of actually increasing the team of people that are able to go and visit somebody in the hospital. So that pastors and elders will still do the initial visit, but we're looking for about 10 to 12 people to actually sign up and say, hey, I'm willing to go and do a hospital visit, or where we miss people a lot, and this is probably your experience, is that they go to the hospital, and then they go home, and they're still sick. But because of just multiple things happening at the church, we go, oh, they're home, they must be better. No, that's not always the case, right? And so we want to care for each other better. So if you are willing to be part of this team, there's going to be a, an orientation training team time on, on April 21st following the, the, the church service. If you're interested, you can go to the church website, sign up on that as well, or go to our Welcome Center uh, and say, hey, I, I think I want to be part of this. Uh, I want more information. Or you can say, yeah, that is something that I really want to be part of. Right? Does that make sense to you? So if you have questions, please come. Uh, and then also... We do enjoy um, coming and loving you when you're sick and in the hospital. Uh, just let us know. You can call the church office. Uh, a lot of you have our cell phone numbers. Uh, sometimes you can even use the, uh, um, the email address that's on the website for just putting a prayer, a prayer request down as well. Um, but it is our heart's intention to love every single person here and to do it better. Uh, Cindy Brode uh, is offering to help me lead up this as well. So thank you so much for Cindy for helping me. So. Sound good? And let's pray. Let's uh, turn it over to Luke here. Thanks, Adam. Uh, good morning. I want to invite you uh, to stand with us this morning. We're going to jump right into singing praises to our great God. Sing all creatures. All creatures of our God and King. Your voice with us sing, oh, praise Him, hallelujah, thou burning sun with golden beam, thou silver moon with softer gleam.
Uh, would you bow your head in prayer with me? Lord, as we come to you um, to join in all of creation that already speaks your praise just by existing, Lord, we want to do it uh, in light of who you are. God, we want to we wanna love one another because you have loved us so greatly. We want to be a loving people. God, we want to be a people who are of immense hope uh, because you are a God of amazing promises. God, we want to be a people who are marked by purity and righteousness because you are a God who is perfectly pure. And so, Lord, as we gather here week in and week out, and Lord, even today, would you make our, uh, our gathering here, our attendance here, be because we love you, not because this is a convenient community, not because this is a comfortable routine, not because this is a, an easy way for people to look at us and think, wow, that, that person goes to church. Lord, we want it to be because we love you. And so for those of us who have grown apathetic about you or have grown apathetic about uh, our sin, Lord, would you shake us awake? Our sin put Christ on the cross. That's, uh, it, it's deep. But Lord, you are willing to go. That's an amazing God. We serve an awesome God. And so Lord, where there's been people who have been so discouraged and paralyzed by shame by their sin, Lord, would you meet us with that grace, Lord, that you are holding open-handed generously for us to accept and be welcomed in. Lord, you are welcoming us this morning. We're not here to appease you. We're here to be with you. And so, Lord, uh, we want to commune with you. Reveal yourself to us as we continue to worship. Amen. Let's remember what Christ's sacrifice accomplishes for us today, right now, in this room, and as we go out into the rest of life. that last chorus just one more time one with himself I cannot die I, let's just listen to each other sing one with himself I cannot die my soul is purchased with his blood my life is filled with Christ on high with Christ my Savior
Hear the word of the Lord. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise and his greatness no one can fathom. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. He is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures through all generations. The Lord is trustworthy in all he promises and faithful in all he does. The Lord upholds all who fall and lifts up all who are bowed down. He is righteous in all his ways and faithful in all he does. Near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth, and he watches over all who love him. That's an awesome God, is it not, church? So we get to praise this God. He's not just an awesome God. He's our awesome God. So our mouths will speak and praise. Let every creature praise his name. Lift it up. Our God is awesome. Our God is an awesome God.
As we uh, prepare to go before the throne of God in prayer, I want to read to you Psalm 118, which says, O give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, his steadfast love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, his steadfast love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, his steadfast love endures forever. Out of my distress, I called on the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me free. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is on my side as my helper. I shall look to triumph on those who hate me. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than trust in princes. All nations surround me. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They surround me, surround me on every side. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They surround me like bees. They went out like the, a fire among thorns. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. I was pushed hard so that I was falling, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Glad songs of salvation are the, in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord exalts. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has disciplined me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open the gates of righteousness that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has made his light shine upon us. Bind the festival light, the festival sacrifice with cords up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, and I will extol you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Join me in prayer. Father, we give thanks to you, for you are good, and your steadfast love endures forever. Let all of God's people cry out that your steadfast love endures forever. Indeed, Father, your steadfast love endures, even when we are in distress, even when life seems so overwhelming, even when it seems like the whole world is against us, your love endures endures forever we do not need to fear whether it be man or disease or spiritual warfare because you are on our side you are our helper and you are our strength and therefore we continue to cry out that your steadfast love endures forever we put our trust not in man or in government but in the lord jesus christ it is christ who is our strength and our song. It is Christ who is our salvation. It is because of Christ we can boldly say that I shall not die, but I shall live. And when we face our final breath, we can say in victory, Lord, you, your steadfast love endures forever. We look to our Savior. We look to his sacrifice. We look to his victory. And we cannot help but sing out, your steadfast love endures forever. Father, we also want to take time now to lift up many individuals who maybe need to be reminded that your steadfast love endures forever. Father, we want to lift up a few who are suffering right now. We pray for Tom Creedon, who has non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and has been placed on hospice. We pray that you would be his strength and that you would bless him to be surrounded by his family this week. 
We also pray for Dan Erie, who was in the hospital with diverticulosis. We pray that he would be able to come home soon. We also want to lift up our homebound of the week, Bruce Rains. We ask that you would bless him today. And we pray for Linda, that you would give her strength as she cares for him. May they both look to you as their Lord, as their strength, and not fearing what the future may hold. Father, I thank you that this church is a church who is passionate about outreach. And we want to pray for our outreach person of the week, D and J. And we ask, Father, that you would bless their ministry. Give them boldness and wisdom to take advantage of every opportunity to share the gospel. We thank you for the opportunities they have taken advantage of. And we pray for those two taxi cab drivers. We also pray that you would be their strength, especially in the next three weeks as they say that they have a heavy burden. We want to lift up Zeke Collier, our college student of the week. May he find his strength in you as well. Help him to find fellow faithful believers who can help sharpen him and grow him in the faith. We pray for his major projects that are due. Help him to be diligent in his time and his efforts. And we praise you for blessing him with an internship this summer. Help him to continue to pursue hard after you. Father, we also want to lift up Pastor Adam, Alex Moyer, and Tim Warner, our pastor, elder, and deacon of the week. Father, we thank you for these faithful men and their servants' hearts. Continue to bless them and use them for your glory. And we would ask that you would give them wisdom and discernment as they continue to serve this church and serve it well. Finally, Father, as this is Passion Week, we pray that we would be especially reminded of what Christ has done for us, that he was the stone that the builders rejected, who has become the cornerstone, that he willingly suffered not only at the hands of man, but at the hands of God in order to redeem us, and that he rose again on the third day, defeating sin and death, and has put on the crown of victory. In him, who or what do we need to fear? Nothing and no one. He holds us in his hand. So throughout this week especially, Father, we pray that we would continue to cry out that your steadfast love endures forever. And we pray this all in the victory of Christ's name. Amen. The kids are now dismissed. The Gospels are a set of accounts, each written by a different author about our Lord Jesus Christ. But they're not so different as to paint contradicting pictures of Jesus. Like the angles of a diamond, each Gospel adds to the fullness of Jesus' beauty and majesty. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are often referred to as the Synoptic Gospels, meaning they give an overall synopsis of Jesus' life, ministry, death, and resurrection. But the tone shifts in the fourth gospel, the gospel of John. He does not attempt to tell a comprehensive story of Jesus. By his own words, Jesus did many things. And if every one of them were written down, there would not have been enough books in the world to fill them. Instead, John aims to do one thing above anything else in his writing, to leave no doubt in the reader's mind that this person, the man Jesus Christ, is the Son of God. That's why John spends almost half his gospel on the last seven days of Jesus, where he picks details that underscore Christ's divinity. In John's gospel, he explains why Jesus went out of his way to find a donkey before his procession into Jerusalem, in order that he might fulfill messianic prophecies. We stand at the foot of the cross to hear our Lord's dying words, it is finished proving he is the one begotten Son who alone can satisfy the Father's wrath and purchase forgiveness for our sins. And we see the risen Jesus comfort the empty tomb's first visitor, Mary, and tell her that he will soon go to the Father, his God, and her God. So this Passion Week, prepare to see Jesus truly and clearly, the Son of God who was and is and is to come. Amen. You can clap for Jesus.
Morning, everybody. Pray for me. I'm feeling, I'm feeling weak. I'm feeling weak because as we're singing, and you all know, when you get overwhelmed, when you want people that you love to know the Savior that you do, you want your Savior to rescue them as well. Just overwhelmed with that right now. So turn in your gospel, turn in your Bible to the gospel of John. We're going to look at John this morning, and we're going to look at John chapter 12. John chapter 12, what's famously called the triumphal entry. It's John chapter 12, verses 12 through 19. I'm going to read it for you, and then we're going to ask the Lord to visit us in a special way. John says, the next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees. They went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey, sat on it, just as it is written, fear not, daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's coat. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. Verse 17, the crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard he had done this sign. Verse 19, so the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you're gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Amen. Father, we come before you. Help us now to see Jesus rightly. Rightly. Lord, it's it's been my prayer all week long that we would see him rightly by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so if there's anybody in this room Oh, God, or the people that were heavily on my heart or anybody else outside of this room who's heavy on my brothers and sisters and my friends' hearts that do not know you, we ask, oh, God, would you spiritually awaken them to to who our sweet Savior Jesus Christ really is, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the one who made all things, the one who made them and became flesh and blood, dwelling among us and then going to the cross to die for us and to take away our sins and your wrath so that they can have eternal life. So, Lord, be with us now. Reveal yourself. Help us to see you in all your glory as the King. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, as I was meditating on this particular text all week long, trying to understand what the crowds and the Pharisees were thinking about Jesus I thought about myself years ago when I was a religious, hear this, unbeliever. A religious unbeliever. And when I was thinking about them going to meet Jesus and pursue Jesus, I thought about the one time that I actually did that in my unsaved years when I was a religious unbeliever who did not seek God, but there was one time that I remember when I did seek him, it's when my girlfriend broke up with me. And why did I seek Jesus? So that he would persuade my girlfriend to take me back again. And I thought to myself, that's what religious unbelievers do. That's what they do. Now, I'm calling them religious unbelievers because, like me, we're going to see these people have a religious background. But they're unbelievers in the sense that Jesus, when he describes somebody who is truly saved as a believer, they are not that. 
They are not that. And so I ask the question, what, what is an indicator that someone might be a religious unbeliever? And here is my answer. I wrote down, I would say a person who is an un, a religious unbeliever is a person who only wants Jesus to save them in this life ultimately from poverty or pain and give them their best life now. And that's all they want them for. If you remember, I quoted last week a preacher that the pastors heard at a pastor's conference two weeks ago, and he said this, people who use Jesus are people who will leave Jesus. He's absolutely correct. And so I have to ask the question this morning, what about you? You. I love you too much not to ask this question. Why are you here? Why are you here? Maybe you've met Jesus in the past, or maybe you want to meet Jesus. But the question I have for you is, why do you want to meet Jesus? I hope it's for all the right reasons, that you want him to save you from your sin. Or is it to save you ultimately from poverty or pain or suffering in this life? I hope it's not ultimately that. Now, hear me rightly. Jesus cares about those things. He really cares. We've seen that in the Gospel of Matthew as he healed people from the death, blindness, mute. But he also knows that the main reason that he came was to save you and I from our greatest problem. And our greatest problem is not poverty, it is not pain. That's not our greatest problem. Our greatest problem is our enmity with Almighty God, whom we are separated from because of our sin. That's what Isaiah has said. What separates you from a holy God is your iniquity, is your sins. That keeps you away from Him and Him away from you. That's our greatest problem. And that's why the Lord Jesus came, to save us from the sins of lust and lying, the sins of ungodly anger and adultery, the sins of slander and sexual immorality, the sins of greed and gluttony, the sins of loving our hobbies more than God. And Jesus knows that the wages of sin is death. And without blood, there is no forgiveness. Jesus knows this, and that is why our Lord came 2,000 years ago to take care of our greatest problem. It's a different agenda than the people have in this text. A different agenda between the Lord Jesus and why he has come the first time and what these people want in a king. And so a good way to look at this, the way John has set this up, is to look at the different groups of people who were there. And what they were thinking versus what our Lord was thinking when he is coming into Jerusalem. So here we go. We're entering this scene of the triumphal entry. Now, this is recorded in all four of the Gospels, and that makes this event a very significant event in the life of our Lord. And you know this because this is where the crowds declare him to be the king, the king of Israel. But is he the king that they want? Look at verses 12 and 13. What we're going to notice in this text is that they want a king who's going to save them ultimately from temporary things. I want to show you that. The next day, 
John writes, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees, went out to meet him. And they're crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king, the king of Israel. So, so what's going on here? And the first question we ask, what's, what's he talking about when he says it's, it's the next day? The next day. Well, it's the day after the meal with Lazarus. Back in verse 1. It's the day after. Lazarus. You know who Lazarus is? He just raised Lazarus from the dead in chapter 11. And so we have a meal. Martha is serving. Mary comes in. You know this story. If you're familiar with the Bible, she anoints his feet. If you remember that. With an expensive ointment, wiped his feet with her hair. And you remember what the wicked Judas said. Why is she doing that and wasting that ointment? That could have been sold and we could have given the money to the poor. And we know he didn't give a rip about the poor. He wanted to help himself into the money bag. He was the treasurer. And so Jesus, he said this in verse 7, leave her alone. So that she may keep it, meaning the rest of the ointment. And look at what he says. For the day of my burial. He is thinking death right now. And then we read in verse 9 that a large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there with Lazarus and his sisters, and so they came to see him and Lazarus, whom he raised from the dead. And so the day after that, that's where we're at in verse 12. Where it says this, the crowd, the large crowd, it's the same large crowd that had come to the feast in Jerusalem. End of the verse. It's the feast at the city of Jerusalem. And this feast was the Passover feast. If you remember the Passover, it's what the Israelites, the Jews, would celebrate every year. Remembering the day when God delivered Israel from the bondage of Egypt. You remember that, Exodus. They held the Israelites as slaves. And God wanted to deliver his people So that they could go out into the promised land and worship him. And he sent plagues, a number of them. And the Pharaoh would not let him go. And so there was one more he was going to send. And he said to the Israelites, I want you to sacrifice a lamb. I want you to put the blood over the doorpost. So when I send the death angel to wipe out the firstborn, that was the last plague, if you will. He's going to see that blood and he's going to. Pass over, right? It's going to pass over and not slay your firstborn. And that's exactly what happened. And so that's what they're celebrating here. And Josephus, the Jewish historian, estimated that 2.5 million Jews would be there. They would come from all over. Plus, you got the Jews in Jerusalem. Some people say, ah, gee, he was just trying to make that look good. Inflated the numbers, whatever, there's a large crowd. That's what it means. It's large. A lot of people there. And it says that the crowd heard. So they heard Jesus was coming to the feast. Now you have to understand the excitement of this crowd. Number one, they're Jews. They're Jews who are familiar with their Old Testament. They would have known about the kings of old that made Israel a great nation and conquered the other nations around them because God was with them. And then you combine that with a promise that one day, one day, a king from the line of King David would come and save the people of God once again. But my question is, save them from what? Secondly, many of these Jews would have been from the region of Galilee, 
where he did many of his miracles, heard his preaching. So think with me, these people. You have Nathaniel in this crowd. You remember Nathaniel meeting Jesus at the end of chapter 1? Hearing Jesus say, after he said, can anything good come from Nazareth? Jesus says, I saw you under the fig tree. Jesus wasn't anywhere near him. And Nathaniel says, surely you are, Rabbi, the Son of God, the King of Israel. That's chapter 1. Chapter 2, we have him turning water into wine. Chapter 4, we have him telling a woman everything that she's ever done. At the end of chapter 4, he heals an official son who was almost dead. Chapter 5, healing an invalid of 38 years. Chapter 5, claiming to be equal with God. And the Pharisees wanted to stone him for that. Chapter 6, feeding 5,000, which would have been 20,000 people strong if you include the women and the children. With five loaves of bread. Two fish. And then healing a blind man in chapter 9 who was blind from birth. And then he raises a man from the dead in chapter 11. Who was dead for four days. Already in the tomb. And Jesus comes along with a crowd, tells them, remove the stone. Could you imagine, put yourself in the crowd's shoes? This man who looks just like us. Normal, flesh and blood, doing all of these things. And he says, move that stone. And then he calls forth, Lazarus, come out. And the man comes out with his grave clothes on. What? Hey, men, this is more than just a man. And then he has dinner with him. (laughs) It's incredible. And so this miracle, I want you to hear this. This miracle of raising Lazarus from the dead was done near Jerusalem. And so there was a crowd, saw the whole thing, and they are telling everybody else who wasn't there. Look at verses 17 and 18. The crowd that had been with him, Jesus, when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead, continued to bear witness. They're bearing witness. They're telling everybody else, we were there. We saw it. Eyewitness testimony. In verse 18, so the reason... John writes, why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard he had done this sign. So, I mean, picture this. you got a crowd of people who were there. They were present at this miracle, telling another crowd of people about this miracle that they have seen and witnessed. And so they're all excited. All kinds of people. They're a big crowd. They're all excited to Jesus, to see Jesus firsthand and So you put these crowds together, and they go out to meet Jesus. Did you notice that in verse 18? The crowd went out to meet Jesus when they heard that he was coming to Jerusalem, verse 1. Now, I read this coming to Jerusalem. Jesus, he's coming, he's coming. If you're familiar with the Gospel of John, do you remember reading back in 7 when he said, I'm not going to Jerusalem. You remember that? When his brothers said, go up to Jerusalem. Why are you hiding your power? Go up to Jerusalem. Show the world your incredible power. And then John writes, even his brothers didn't believe in him. They just wanted him to go up to do miraculous things. And I think they wanted him to do that so that other people say, ah, we believe he is the Messiah. And they probably say, well, yeah, 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 we do too. They were skeptical. They weren't even believing in him. And and Jesus says, I'm not going up with you. Literally says, I'm not going up with you now. Because I'm not going up in the way that you want me to go up. Jesus had his own set of rules, by the way. He only obeyed the will of his father. Now, there's another reason that he gives in chapter 7 why he didn't go up. And I'm going to tell you about that later. Here, he's accepting this. 
declaration from the crowds. He's coming, and he's going to accept their declaration, their affirmation that he is the king of the Jews. When it wasn't only in chapter 7 he wouldn't go up to Jerusalem, it was back in chapter 6 that the people wanted to try and force him to be king. Do you remember that? After he fed the 5,000, the people, they were thinking he is the Messiah. Let's force him to be our king. And what did Jesus do? You remember? Where did he go? He left. But here, here, he's accepting this. He's accepting this. But what we have to understand is that even though he accepts this because he is the king of the Jews, the crowds and Jesus have far different agendas. Far different agendas. And so we want to look at what these folks are thinking, what the crowd's thinking, what the Pharisees are thinking, as opposed to what the Lord Jesus is thinking. And we're going to start with the crowd. We're going to start with the crowd. And, he, and you know this. You good Bible scholars and students, you know this. You've heard this a million times, that the people wanted a military king, right? So put yourself in their shoes. What's motivating them? Politics. They are politically motivated here. Why? Because they want Jesus to save them from the here and now. You know that. So verse 13, they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. Now again, what's going on here? What is going on here? There's a number of clues in the text, starting with the branches that they would cut off, the palm trees that, not necessarily in Jerusalem, but they'd be all over the area. And this was typically associated in the Old Testament, only with the Feast of Tabernacles. Tabernacles, shelters. It's kind of what this symbolized. But during the time between the Old Testament and the New Testament, or in Jesus' day, that period, you know what I'm talking about? The intertestamental period between the Old Testament and the New Testament, 400 years in between. The palm branch, hear this, became a symbol of national victory. When... The Jews led by Simon the Maccabee. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Familiar with the Apocrypha? Which we do not consider inspired, by the way. By the Lord. It's being God's word. But it gives history. And so the history is, Simon Maccabee led a revolt, took Jerusalem back from the Syrians, and in 1 Maccabees it says this, they entered Jerusalem with praise and palm branches. Palm branches. So the palm branches became a national symbol. So much so that they would break out the palm branches at the rededication of the temple in 164 AD. Appearing on coins during the Jewish and Roman wars a generation after the Lord Jesus Christ. So this became a symbol of national hope. And so I have no doubt that this massive crowd is recalling that incredible deliverance, that national symbol. And then you combine that with the Old Testament promise of a messianic king who's going to come and deliver Israel again. And in their minds, here's what they're thinking. Liberation Day has finally come. Because you know this, right now, right now the Romans ruled over the Jews in an oppressive manner. And they didn't like it. They hated the Romans for this, and so their hopes are through the roof. This man raises people from the dead. We were promised. We were promised a messianic king to come and deliver us. This is politically, militarily motivated, gang. They were... Taking the promise of a messianic king coming and sitting on David's throne forever and ever is coming the first time to conquer Rome, sit on the throne, and make our nation great again and conquer everybody else. That's that's what's in their minds. I'm just trying to put myself in their shoes. 
a national rally going on here. Our leader has come to save us from our enemies, set us free again, put us on top like King David did, you know. And so instead of waving American flags, they're waving palm branches. That's what they're doing here. It was a sign of victory. Victory's coming. Salvation is coming in the form of national liberation at the hands of our king. And again, I thought to myself, I have to be mindful here because I love America. Don't you love America? I love America. But sometimes I think we might fall into the trap that Jesus wants to make our nation or any other nation during the church age a Christian utopia. That's not happening in the church age. It's not. That's coming. That's coming when the new Jerusalem comes. Doesn't mean we don't want to be involved, influenced for Christian principles morality and win people to Christ. But his agenda is not a Christian utopia for any country on the earth right now during the church age. That's not his main mission. They thought it was for Israel. This is why they cry out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Even the king of Israel. You heard the psalm. Jules wrote, read the psalm. It comes from Psalm 118. This was sung every morning by the temple choir during the major Jewish festivals, including Passover. It came from a group of psalms that they called the Hallel. Sound familiar? You ever hear that? They would sing a portion of it every morning. And this crowd, they're not even singing it, man. They're shouting it. They're crying out. Hosanna! Hosanna! You know what that means? You know what that means, don't you? Yes! Save us! Save us now! Oh, King, save us now, we pray! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That was always a reference for the Messiah who would come and usher in the Messianic age. That's why they say even the king of Israel. That's not a quotation directly from the psalm, but it's who they understood the psalm to be referring to. It's the messianic king. How do we know this? Because Matthew tells us they also cried out, son of David. And so they believe this to be the promised Messiah. And Jesus, our Lord Jesus, is accepting this title and this declaration from the crowds when again he did not allow them to make him king by force back in John 6 verse 15. And I thought, wow, what a celebration. Everybody's celebrating this. Jesus is rightfully accepting it. I mean, so much so that he told the religious leaders in Matthew, do you remember this? They were mad. They were indignant that the children were crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David. And Jesus quoted the Old Testament. He said, out of the mouths of infants and nursing babies, you have ordained praise. Don't you know your Bibles? That was a psalm of praise, gang, to Yahweh, the God of the Old Testament, Jesus here is associating himself with the God of the Old Testament and declaring himself to be the divine messianic king to come. Let him do it. Let him do it. And then when the Pharisees tried to get him to silence the disciples, do you remember what the Lord Jesus said? Man, if they go silent, the rocks will cry out because I am the king. I am the king. But here's what we have to see. Even though the Lord Jesus accepted their praise that he is the king of the Jews, our Lord knew. He knew that he would not be the king they expected. 
at this time. Do you know how I know that? Because in the Gospel of Luke, right after Luke tells us about the triumphal entry, Jesus weeps. He weeps over Jerusalem and he says, Oh, Jerusalem, if you would have known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they're hidden from your eyes. Why, Jesus? Because you did not know the time of your visitation of your true king. That's what he means. The true Messiah. You didn't see him. You didn't recognize him. Five days from now, Pharisees and the leaders are going to turn on me. And a number of you are going to join them. They wanted a military king and a political leader. And yet Jesus was coming as a servant king. A servant king who was going to give his life for the sins of the people. So you have to understand, when he's entering Jerusalem, he is not entering into his coronation just yet. He's entering into his death. He's entering into his death. This kicks it off the whole week. Jules read the verse that one commentator said, I wish they would have meditated on the entire psalm, Psalm 118. Because you, know, you want to know what else it says in Psalm 118? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is used all over the New Testament as a description of the Jews who missed the cornerstone. They missed him, and they killed him. They don't understand, brothers and sisters and friends. They don't understand. They don't see this rightly. I want to get to that when we get to the crowd and the Pharisees and even the disciples. They want a king for a different reason than why Jesus came. And so that's why he comes to Jerusalem riding on a donkey instead of a war horse. Because he came to conquer sin and not Rome. Look at this. Verses 14 and 15. And Jesus found a young donkey, sat on it just as it is written. Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's coat. Now, the other gospels tell us a little bit more about getting this donkey if you're familiar with the other Gospels, Jesus told the two disciples, go into the village in front of you. Immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them back to me. Now, don't just read that and miss the fact that Jesus is orchestrating this whole thing. He tells them what they're going to find. And then he says, if the owner says something to you, tell the owner this, that the master needs it, and the owner will give it to you. It happens just the way, just the way he said. This is our Christ. This is our Lord Jesus. He orchestrates everything. He's in charge and rules over everything, including this event. And so they bring it. Jesus finds it, it says, all because he wanted to fulfill the prophecy about him from Zechariah 9.9. 9. That prophecy was written 500 years before he ever walked on this earth. And John quotes it in verse 15. Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's coat. Now the other gospels tell us that they were spreading garments on the road in front of him. Matthew talks about that. Why are they doing that? Because they're declaring him to be the king. They're doing what their forefathers did in the Old Testament. When a man became king, back in 2 Kings, it says they anointed the, the coming king, and in haste, every man took his garment and put it under the anointed king, and they blew the trumpet and proclaimed, Jehu is king. Now they're declaring Jesus is king by putting their garments on the road. And again, he accepts it. And he's proving it. He is the king. He's proving it by fulfilling the words of Zechariah 9. 9. Now, I was telling the brothers earlier in the week, 
I would love to know the sequence of events. You know, because it talks about a crowd going to him. There's a crowd behind and before. And, and, and when, did this, when did he sit on this donkey and all that kind of stuff? Because I'm, I'm just wondering if the crowds were let down. When they see him getting on a donkey, I could see some people say, what? what? Where's the horse? Where's the war horse? Uh, donkey? Jesus will be coming back on a white horse. In Revelation 19.11, I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. And the one sitting on it is called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. That's when he'll conquer the nations in the future. Now, coming on a donkey was a sign of peace. It was a sign of peace. The new king is coming into Jerusalem in peace. I get that from Solomon's coronation. It's the new king of Israel in 1 Kings 1. He said he came into town riding on a donkey bringing peace. Bringing peace. And yet it's interesting. You, you read on in that, that prophecy in Zechariah. It goes on to say that the Messiah will bring salvation. Humble and mounted on a donkey. And later it, it says the war horse will be cut off. The, ba the battle bows will be broken. And this king will come and speak peace to the nations, and his rule shall be from sea to sea. And I'm thinking, there it is again, brothers and sisters. Whenever you read prophecy, I want you to think of something, especially in the Old Testament, even in the New. There typically is a near and a far fulfillment. A near and a far he is coming to bring salvation the first time. And yes, he was ascended to where he is right now, and he rules from sea to sea, rules over everything. But when we experience that firsthand, when he's here, he's in the future. So it's almost like this has been fulfilled, and it will be fulfilled. But here's my question. Then what kind of peace is he coming to bring? What kind of peace is he coming to bring? That's what I'm asking myself. What kind of peace? And then I answered it. The greatest peace that we need. The peace between us and God. Between us and God. Think about it. This is Passover. You know what somebody said? 2.5 million Jews. Do you want to know how many lambs were slaughtered? 250,000. Slaughtered lambs. Blood everywhere. Why? Pointing to him. Pointing to him. To him who were told in the Old Testament was going to come and shed his blood for the sins of the people and make peace between people and God, reconciling them so that God's wrath no longer remains on us because we deserve to be punished for our lust and our lying. We deserve it. And Jesus, in his great love, thank you, Jesus, left heaven, became like one of us to die for us. That's why he's riding into Jerusalem, gang. To take away our sin, to remove God's wrath, and to make peace between us and God. This is why I think this text for John falls right in between Jesus' words about burial in verse 7. And then the next section when he tells his disciples about a grain of wheat falling into the earth and dying in order to produce fruit. I have to die to ransom a people from every tribe, tongue, nation, or language. And that includes you all. In chapter 10, Jesus talking about the good shepherd laying down his life for the sheep. He says, I got other sheep not of this fold. That's us. Our God and Savior came into this world to go to that cross for you and me. For us to shed his blood. That's why he's writing into Jerusalem. And friends, nobody gets this. Nobody gets this yet, even the disciples. Look at this, verse 16. We got to ask the question, why doesn't anybody get this yet? His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, it says, then they remembered 
that these things have been written about him and have been done to him. You, you know how this worked for the disciples. I do believe they were truly saved. I do believe they had some measure of the Spirit, but they didn't have the fullness of the Spirit just yet. That's why John's saying, until he's glorified, until Jesus went back to heaven and poured out the Spirit. Then it landed on them. Ah! Oh, ah! Oh, that's why Jesus said what he said. That's why he did what he did. They needed the Spirit. You remember how dense they were during his ministry? We would have been the same way. Jesus is describing his death, and Peter says, not on my watch. Get behind me, Satan. You, have, you, you don't get it. Jesus said in chapter 14 to them, the Spirit whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Now you got to remember, even in the first chapter of the book of Acts, to remember what the disciples said to the resurrected Lord Jesus. Are you at this time going to restore Israel? Jesus says, you just wait here until the power of the Most High comes upon you, meaning the Holy Spirit of God at Pentecost. Brothers and sisters, praise the Lord for his Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord for the Holy Spirit. We wouldn't be here without the Holy Spirit. Nobody would be saved without the Holy Spirit. That's why Jesus said, unless a man is born again by the Spirit, he can't see. He's dead. He's blind to the things of God. They don't recognize or see the Lord of glory. That's what Paul wrote about the Pharisees. They don't see him. We don't get it. We don't understand. I think I told you this before. My goodness gracious, I was so dead in my sin, even though I grew up in the church. Jennifer, before the Lord saved me, when she first met me, was walking with the Lord. She was singing at a Good Friday service, and she says, why don't you come? And so my brother and I went to that service, and I remember driving away and saying to my brother, why was everybody so sad? I thought religion makes you happy. It was Good Friday. Our Lord died. Clueless. Clueless. Because I didn't have the Spirit. But oh, when he got a hold of me. Oh, when he got a hold of me. Changed everything. I could see. Called on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to save me. And the scales fell. My heart changed. My desires were for him now. I knew who he was. The God man who came, who conquered sin for me. Died, rose again so that we could have eternal life. Praise the Lord for the spirit whom he gives to save, sanctify, satisfy. The crowds don't get it. I know I'm almost out of time. They don't get this. They don't. The only reason they're out there is because this man raised Lazarus from the dead. And because he raised Lazarus from the dead, my mind that doesn't understand the things of God, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, only sees Jesus as a military conqueror. That's why he's here. He's going to conquer the Romans. And then, of course, the Pharisees. You have the Pharisees. Who don't get it? You have the disciples who don't get it just yet. You have the crowds that don't get it. You, don't, you have the Pharisees. They don't get it. Verse 19. The Pharisees said to one another, you see that you're gaining the... Did you hear what it said? They said to one another, they must be so frustrated. They're talking to each other. <laughs> you're gaining nothing. The whole world's got after him. Now, here's the difference. If they were in the spirit like John the Baptist was, they would have said, they should. That's great. Let us decrease him, increase, go to him. He's the one. He's the king. He is God in the flesh. He's the Lamb of God who came to give his life for the world. Go, go, go. But they didn't want that at all. They wanted to kill him. Why? Because they wanted their best life now, gang. They were in charge of keeping order. They saw a potential uprising. Ah, oh, Rome's going to take our place away. They were jealous of him because the people are going after Jesus now. That means my fame is going away. And when the people go away, they're not going to 
line our pockets anymore. We're told that they love money. They didn't get it. So as we, we wrap up here, I want to take a few minutes to reflect on a couple of things. Number one, do you truly understand who Jesus is and why he came the first time? Do you understand that? Or is what I have been saying just or maybe you don't even care what I'm saying. Here would be my challenge to you. Have you been born again? Without that, you're not going to get it or care or desire or see Jesus for who he really is and what he has done, who he is now. You're just not going to get it. And my plea with you would be to cry out and ask the Lord of glory to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And then, for those who have been born again, I think we should take some time and thank our Lord for new birth, for the presence of the Holy Spirit who is with us now, who granted us faith to believe. Eyes spiritually awakening us to give us eyes of faith that we could see Christ for who he is and what he has done. The fact that the Spirit is with us and in us, conforming us into the image of Jesus and transforming our lives. Let's thank the Lord for the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Let's take a few minutes just to do that. Amen. I invite you to join with us as we stand and, and give God all the glory and call Jesus King.
forsaken by a traitor's kiss. The curse of sin and centuries did pierce the lowly prince of peace. Lifted high the sinless man, crucified the spotless lamb. He is king forevermore, amen? Boy, boy, I had to go to Peter's sermon at Pentecost. Boy, they got it now. After the Spirit was given, and he preaches a sermon, and he says, quoting the Old Testament, in the last days between our Lord's resurrection and when he comes back, God declares, I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Brothers, I say to you with confidence about David He both died, was buried. His tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet, knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Christ. He was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up. And of that we all are witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God where he still is. Having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. Spirit of God is here with us and in us for the true believer. The living God lives inside of you. Praise him for that. Now we know the agenda of our Lord's first coming, don't we? And the second. Father, we thank you so much for helping us, really making us alive. When Paul writes in Ephesians that we were dead in sin. Dead in sin, slaves to the devil. Called disobedient children. But we read those glorious verses later when it says, but God made us alive together with the Lord Jesus Christ. To be able to see him in all of his glory and what he has done for us on that cross that we will talk about Friday night when he breathed his last breath and said, it is finished. Lord, we owe you everything for what you have done for us on the cross. But then we read three days later that you conquered sin, death, and the devil. And we love you, we worship you, help us to reflect, to reflect on those things this week. Spend time with you, thanking you for who you are and what you've done in our lives, what you promised to do in our lives. We thank you for this and all of God's people said, amen. Love you. If you like prayer.
There will be prayer counselors down here in the front of the worship center. 